Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Liz Neely, and I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating today's session. This is Underwater, Climate Change and Me. And if you are not interested in hearing about oceans and coral reefs, well, first, I'm sorry for you. And also, you may <laughs> help yourself out, out of the room. Um, we are going to be diving into 45 minutes of conversation about our oceans. We'll start in sun-drenched, shallow waters with coral reefs, and then make our way down into darker, more mysterious depths. And what I'm excited about is to be joined by two incredible marine scientists and authors. To joining us today, we have the author of Life on the Rocks, Building a Future for Coral Reefs, Dr. Julie Burwald. as well as an intrepid explorer, research scientist, and author of Below the Edge of Darkness, a memoir of exploring light and life in the deep sea, Dr. Edith Witter. We'd like to thank the National Endowments for the Arts for sponsoring this stage. And our plan for our, our for time today is to explore both of these books, which explore ocean science as well as personal stories. Julie and Edie both take us on personal journeys, whether that's navigating medical mysteries um, or struggling, sometimes despairing before pushing forward. Um, my own career path started in ocean conservation, so it's a personal joy to explore these things. And I'm so excited to get into this together. So our plan is, I'm going to ask each of them to make a provocative statement or ask a question to get all of you thinking. Because in the final 15 minutes of the session today, we will take questions from you. So get those brains thinking. Um, I'm going to hand the floor over to both Julie and Edie in turn to talk about their books. And then we'll talk for 15 minutes or so before we dive in. At the end of the time today, uh, you'll be able to get books signed by our two authors. All right. so. Provocative statements or questions. Julie, let's start with you. Um, so the story of the coral reefs is one of struggle. I think we all know that. Um, and so my question is, currently predictions are that by 2050, 99% of the coral reefs will be lost on our planet. And if that's the case, what can we as terrestrial people terrestrial beings, people who live up here on land, do to make what's beneath the waves less invisible to us? Great. So in 2011, we got, or 2012, we got the first video of a giant squid in the deep sea. The first time we were able to record this creature in its own environment. And I maintain that the reason it took so long to do that is that we were doing it wrong. We were scaring them away. If it took that long to record an animal over four stories tall, how many other creatures are there in the deep sea that we don't even know about? Giant squid happen to float when they die, so we had dead specimens, so we knew they existed. What about the stuff that doesn't float? Great. All right, and so on that note, let's talk a little bit about your books and high-level takeaways people need to understand as they approach these questions. Julie. OK. Um, so I'm going to forward to a slide. Um, so this is a coral reef. And the coral reefs are, take up less than 1% of the ocean's area, so they're quite, they're quite small in terms of the space they take up, but they have a disproportional effect on marine life. It's estimated that a quarter of all marine species depend on coral reefs at some point of their life. And coral reefs are these incredibly vibrant, abundant places, rich, rich, rich in marine life. But uh, coral have a problem. They're bumping up against climate change. The reason why coral are, first of all, animals. They're kind of like little sea anemones that live in colonies. The, most of them are about the size of a pencil eraser. 
And their superpower is that in, in their tissues, and you can see in that number one, the little green dots are algae. And those algae photosynthesize and feed 90% of the sugar they make to the coral. And that is so much energy that the coral can actually make stone. They make the limestone skeletons that they live inside of, and that creates the architecture of a reef. But when temperatures rise, we don't know exactly who starts it, but either the coral kicks out the algae or the algae just abandons the coral and takes with it its color and also its sugar. So suddenly the coral's on starvation rations and it's, it's bleached, it's called bleached at that point. If the temperature doesn't fall, if the temperature falls, the symbiosis can be reestablished, but if it doesn't, the coral die. And then a bleached reach, reef looks like um, skeleton, bones, in a, in a graveyard, and that's ultimately what it is. Um, but, and, and this is a, a true reality for our coral reefs around the world. It's estimated that already half the reefs have bleached. Um, like I said, the projections for 2050 are, are really bad. Um, but it's, the book isn't completely, <laughs> it's not an obituary. Um, there are people around the world doing things that are bolstering the health of the coral reefs. So as they come into this period of stressed, stress as we warm our, our oceans and our, our planet, um, there are things we can do. And so I wanted to tell some of those stories. This is a reef in Indonesia. You can see the rubble beneath those, those um, bars. That's, that's a dead reef. Um, those those um, structures are called reef stars. They're made out of rebar, and they are kind of networked together into a galaxy of reef stars. <laughs> And, and what happens is the reef has resiliency, and after about 18 months, the coral has grown, and um, after three years, you have a reef that is completely restored. So there is, there's a lot of work being done to protect the coral reefs and all of the life they support, um, but it's, it is also a precarious time for them. So it was coral reefs that got me hooked on marine biology. I was smitten, your word, <laughs> which I, when I saw my first coral reef, I was 11 years old and I got to explore this reef and decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. But instead of becoming a coral reef biologist, I became a deep sea biologist. And my first deep sea expedition was in 1982 on a little ship where we went out and hauled nets behind the ship. And this is the primary way we know about life in the deep ocean. We drag nets behind ships. But we were actually able to bring the animals up alive because we kept them in a container that kept them cold. And when we dumped them out, everything glowed. It was incredible. There were pulsating plankton and glowing krill and flashes from mangled jellyfish. I plunged my arm into the trawl bucket, icy, icy cold water, pulled out a red shrimp the size of a hamster. <laughs> and it had nozzles on either side of its mouth that were spewing out sa sapphire blue light that pooled in the palm of my hand, dripped between my fingers, dropped in, back into the trawl bucket, and go to, went on glowing. Everything lit up. These animals had photophores, they had lures, they had all kinds of contraptions for being able to make light, to find food, to attract mates, to defend against predators. And I wanted to know what that world looked like. And I got an opportunity in um, 1984 when I got to be with a group of scientists who were testing a new tool for exploring what was then and still is the largest, least explored habitat on our planet, the Midwater. It was a diving suit called WASP. That's not an acronym, it's just thought, somebody thought it looked like the insect. It has kind of a yellow body, bulbous head, Michelin man arms with pincers on the end of it. And it was developed for the offshore oil industry for diving on oil rigs down to 2,000 feet. I trained in a tank in Port Wainini, and my first open ocean dive was in the Santa Barbara Channel. The first dive, they just put us one in after the other, dropped us to 800 feet to make sure we weren't going to have a claustrophobic meltdown. Um, 
I didn't because I was so intrigued by what, what I was seeing. I, I saved that for the next dive. <laughs> um, but uh, I went down 800 feet and I turned out the lights. And I just was blown away by what I saw. Now at the time, there were no cameras that could record this, but this is what it looks like. It looked like a fireworks display and in fact, Later, when I was interviewed by our local newspaper, they asked me, what's it like down there? And I blurted out, it's like the 4th of July, which of course they used as a headline and I took a tremendous ribbing from my colleagues for such a non-scientific statement. But I have lost track of the number of times over the years I have taken people down for their first dive and had them describe it as being like the 4th of July. It was incredible. I saw jellyfish that just blew my mind, and I included these for Julie, for her <laughs> book, Spineless. Um, so this is a siphonophore chain. You see it on the left in the light, and on the right by its own bioluminescence. It was longer than this room. I brushed up against it with the wasp, and it lit up, propagated down, and everything inside the suit lit up. I could read all the di dials and gauges inside the suit without a flashlight just by the bioluminescence I was seeing. This is a, a, a colony, sort of like a coral. Um, it's just a really bizarre creature, but what an astonishing amount of light. And then some of these jellyfish produce different displays depending on how they were stimulated. So the comb jelly you're seeing in the light on the left when you see that rainbow color, that's because it's being illuminated. That's not bioluminescence. But the bioluminescence, the cold living light that this creature makes, it can make it intrinsically, as you see in the middle image, or extrinsically, where it releases it as a cloud of particles. Just the way an octopus or a squid could release an ink cloud in the face of a predator, tremendous number of these animals can release their bioluminescent chemicals into the face of a predator, temporarily blinding them, allowing them to make an escape. And it was the jellyfish that intrigued me the most. They don't have eyes. So who were these displays being directed at? And why were there different displays in the same jellyfish? And so I developed an electronic jellyfish that imitated certain kinds of displays. And it turned out that was enormously attractive to squid, which is what led to the giant squid hunt. <laughs> Um, I'd like to turn the question to the audience. Raise your hands if you've ever been in the ocean. Keep them raised. Have you snorkeled? <laughs> Do we have scuba divers in the room? So we have a lot of people who've been in oceans. In these books, we are traveling from locations near here, in the Florida Keys, for example, to the opposite side of the planet. And we cover a swath of time from early in your career all the way up to the beginning of the pandemic. That's, that's quite a sweep. I know that writing books that combine science and memoir is an incredible intellectual and emotional challenge. Since this is a book festival, let's start with the process of writing a book. I'm curious about tapping into your memories and what motivated you to write these books at this point. So for both of you. You wanna go first? I'll go first. Go first. Okay. <laughs> so, so, never intended in my life to write a memoir. I was contacted by a literary agent who saw an article about my research in the New York Times, and he asked me if I'd ever thought of writing a memoir, and I said, no, go away. <laughs> and then we got the first video of a giant squid using the electronic jellyfish. That also got written up in a lot of places, and he had contacted me again. This time he had a whole speech prepared about how I had seen things that nobody had ever seen, and I should be willing to share them with the world. And I said, I don't know how, I'm a scientist. We don't write in the first person. And I counted, and from that time, there were 40 emails from him. <laughs> They weren't pushy, but he just kept, you know, have you read this memoir? Have you thought about this? And finally, I just decided, okay, I'll give it a shot. And one Christmas, I just took some time and started trying to write in the first person. And I had kept first person memoirs, I mean, 
diaries, especially of my expeditions, of, of what I saw on each dive, for example. And actually, I ended up having fun writing the book. I just was so freeing compared to writing science papers. I had a blast, and I, I, I was very much um, benefited from the pandemic because I run a not-for-profit that takes a lot of my time, and with the pandemic, I got a little extra time for the rewrite of the book, and anyways, it was unexpected in every possible way. <laughs> I'm glad that your agent was that persistent. I am too. And you can feel the fun that's being had, and you'll enjoy it too, especially in the footnotes. I think your sense of humor <laughs> comes across there. And Julie, what about you? Um, I was a little more intentional in my decision to write in the first person. I, well, I was a scientist, and then I fell off the scientist's path, and I started writing textbooks. Um, and. And then I was actually, um, I got a, a little bit of a gig writing some short articles for National Geographic, which was really cool. And there was a photographer who, was, um, who liked what I was writing, and he asked me to write the text for one of his books. And I was like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a huge reader, like crazy, I read everything. And I think the idea that I could actually be an author was something I hadn't dared to imagine before this photographer asked me to write the text for his photography book. And actually, it was a book of, the first chapter was about coral, and I wrote my heart out, and, and then I didn't hear back from him, and I didn't hear back from him, and I called the editor of the book, and I'm like, what's happened? And he was like, sorry, he's not gonna go with you. And it was in that moment I was like, oh, I really want to be an author, but I, I understood that I needed, I couldn't do it for someone else, I needed to do it for myself. And I needed to find my own voice. And then I started reading a ton of popular science. And I would finish reading those books and I would put them on my nightstand and I'd be like, oh gosh, I could never write a book like that. It, I just could never write a book like that. And then one day I put that book on my nightstand and I was like, I can never write a book like that because I could only write a book in my own voice. And, and that's when I realized that I, I could only write a book, a science book if I combined um, memoir with the science. That was just the way it was gonna come out for me. And, and that's kind of the way I've been writing ever since. Um, and in terms of like memories, it's interesting because I, I have some very vibrant memories, but I, um, didn't keep journals of all my dives, and so I just have to rely on on my memories. Um, now that I am intentional about going out and traveling and, and telling the stories um, about what I'm doing when I'm collecting information for the books, I, I keep journals like crazy, and I do, I do journal after every dive, after every day, after every interview. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really, really helpful. Yeah. So we've already touched briefly on the fact that the way we write in science for publication is very formulaic, it's technical, you remove your personality and your sense of humor from that, and what you've done in these books is, is quite different. Another one of the hard things is that science is perpetually iterating and building on that body of knowledge, and when you write a book like this, you have to stop reading, stop researching, and publish at some point. So Julia, I'm, I'm curious for you, um, is there anything new, anything that you've learned since the publication of the book around the status of coral reefs or the health of the oceans that you wanted to update us on? Yeah, you know, what's really amazing is that coral reefs are still being discovered. And, and to me, that's just, it, it blows my mind because coral have to live shallow in order to provide the algae that live inside their tissue with enough light um, for them to photosynthesize. And so, as we know, the deep ocean's too dark for that to happen. So algae have, I mean, coral have to live close, in clear enough water near the surface that they, they can have um, that photosynthesis that gives them all their energy. And yet, in the last, since the book was published, I've, just, I've learned of three coral reefs that we didn't know of before. There was a deep water one found near Tahiti there's one found at the mouth of the Amazon River, which has long been considered too sedimenty too, for, for coral to be there. And then there's one in Honduras 
in, um, at the mouth of where all these banana plantations were built and, and the fertilizer has been running in the water there for a century and so people thought there was just too much fertilizer and sediment for coral to survive and these are really healthy reefs. So yeah, I, I mean the question is what is the reef of the future going to look like and are these forebears of these future reefs? Um, these are really qu questions that we don't know the answers to right now. Yeah, and I have a follow-up question for you, too. Um, you showed us what bleaching looks like. You mentioned briefly how dire the circumstances are. It feels to me that in your book, you're doing this important balancing act between confronting the brutal reality of the threats to coral reefs, the damage that they've already undergone, while maintaining sort of this unwavering hope in the future and specifically looking for data, looking for evidence, looking for case studies that give us a foundation for having that hope rather than just sort of closing our eyes to it. Um, can you talk about your own feelings um, about the future of coral reefs as you wrote this book? Um, the book sort of starts at this meeting I went to in Florida. It was called Reef Futures. It was in 2018 in December, the end of 2018. and. I went to this meeting expecting just a bunch of really depressed scientists would be there and that people would be reporting in on these mass bleachings around the world, which are happening. But um, what I discovered were all these people who were doing the kind of restoration I showed you in those slides um, and also looking at the incredible genetic flexibility of coral. Coral are great at hybridizing. <laughs> they, they, the idea of species for coral is a very fluid sort of thing. Um, we're actually, there was just a paper published last week that corals seem to be able to integrate mutations from their, their somatic cells, the cells in their, their body, not in their um, reproductive line. They can take mutations from their body and put them into their genetic line and pass them on to their offspring, which is crazy and we should, that shouldn't happen in animals. So, um, there are people doing, uh, making sperm banks of, jelly, of, of corals, making embryo banks of corals, um, so doing- freezing the, freezing Yeah, freezing stuff. them, you know, freezing embryos, like doing all kinds of amazing uh, projects to boost coral reproduction, to boost coral survival, and, and it's definitely not game over. Mm -hmm. So um, the, yeah, I mean, it's these two things are happening. Our oceans are warming. They're warming at an alarming rate. 93% of the heat that carbon dioxide in our atmosphere holds has gone into the ocean. Coral, you know, they only have one to two degrees of a buffer before they start bleaching. But they seem to be um, trying to, yeah, use Adapt. this incredible genetic flexibility they have. And then there's the people around the world who are trying to bolster that. So I, I did try to walk this line, and I'm, I'm glad it, it, it came off that way, because this is not, the story isn't over mm -hmm. on this. Um, it's, it's really an active story. So in reading these books, there's a, an incredible sort of broadening. As a, as a reader, you have to stretch your mind to think about what is happening on a global scale. We're, we're talking about genetic adaptation. We're talking about heroic efforts to create arcs for genetic material. And I think one of the things I want to switch to you, Edie, is um, it's hard for us to imagine the true expanse of some of these ecosystems that we're talking about. So you mentioned sort of briefly in passing that the Midwater is one of the largest you know, ex ecosystems in, on the planet. Can you help us really understand what that means? So the most incredible thing to me is how little of the ocean we have actually explored. Mm -hmm. The number you hear sometimes is we've only explored 5%. That number's not right. Hmm. That was based on mapping, uh, but it, from a remote sensing device at the surface of the ocean, so not actually visiting the place. We're up to closer to 30% now on that. But if you're talking about actually visiting 
just the bottom of the ocean. I'm not even talking about the huge volume above it. We've only visited about 0.05%. Wow. And our usual protocol as humans is to explore a place and then exploit it. Right. But in the ocean, we reverse that. We're exploiting it before we've explored it. So dragging nets that can hold jumbo jets through the oceans to just decimate the fish populations and dragging nets across the bottom that turn unbelievable gardens of Eden into a moonscape that won't sustain life for hundreds of years. All of this is going on, as Julie says, out of sight, out of mind. And we, you know, we're introducing our toxins and um, pollutants into the environment as we're taking out every last fish and form of marine life there is. And as I said, we don't know how this system works. Mm -hmm. We're an ocean planet. When we look for life on other planets, we look for oceans. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, we don't know how our ocean world works. And we, I, did the Artemis go off? Does anybody know? It was supposed to go off today. It's a moonshot. No, it didn't? Yeah, OK, $40 billion we've spent so far. And they still haven't got it off the ground. And it's going to be $90 billion. And we're not spending anything like that on our own planet. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people think <laughs> So you're one of the relatively small number of people who have done some of this exploring of, of our ocean depths. Can you talk about what it feels like? What do you see? How long does it take? So just paint a picture for us as you drop into the depths. So every time I dive in a submersible, I have the opportunity to see something, some, possibly some species never seen before, um, certainly a behavior, something nobody's ever seen before. And that excitement of discovery is so incredible. I think it has to be baked into our DNA. It, it is how we have learned to survive on this planet. We are all explorers. And stories about exploration are what in, you know, excite us from childhood. A secret garden, uh, going down a hole into a wonderland, you know, finding a, a, an ancient cave or an mysterious forest. And th these are all the things that excite us. We are explorers. And I think that we really need to be tapping into that right now, because that is how we have learned to survive on this planet, exploring it, figuring out what's safe, what's not, what we need to do to survive. That's what we need to be doing right now. One of the parts that really struck me it actually is reflected in the title of the book, The Edge of Darkness. So as you're dropping through the water column, you talk about how it's spectacularly blue and then strangely both bright and dark at the same time. And then that zone, that shadow zone, shifts over the course of the day as the sun is high in the sky and then as the sun starts to set. And that sets off an entire incredible biological phenomenon. Do you want to talk about what Yeah, so is? the edge of darkness is a really important shifting place in the ocean because there's so many animals out there that are using vision and they are paying attention to where that edge of darkness is. So at during the day, they go down and hide below the edge of darkness because there's no hiding places. There's no trees or bushes for animals to hide behind. So they hide in the dark depths during the day, and then they come up and feed in the food-rich surface waters where photosynthesis occurs under cover of darkness. And that is the most at massive animal migration pattern on the pla planet, and it happens every single day in the ocean. But different animals handle it in different ways. There's a lot of activity going on, and so I've hung there in the diving suit wasp or in submersibles and watched this traffic of animals going up at night to feed. And it's, it's all being driven by light. And so many of these animals that are living at the edge of darkness, below the edge of darkness, sometimes never seeing sunlight at all, but they have eyes because of bioluminescence, because approximately 75% of the animals in the open ocean environment make light. 
So it could be claimed that it may be the most common form of communication on the planet, which means we probably ought to know a little bit more about it. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I really enjoyed about your book and talking about the scientific process, you opened your slides by saying we didn't used to have cameras that were sensitive enough to detect the light that you were seeing. I love the stories about creating the mechanical tools, the equipment that you need. Um, do you have a favorite story or piece of equipment that's near and dear to your heart? Yeah, so um, I spent all this time in submersibles wondering about how many animals there were just beyond the range of my lights that could see me and I couldn't see them. How was I ever going to be able to see them and you know, observe them? And so I wanted to have a camera system that I could leave on the bottom but I needed it to be unobtrusive, so I wanted to use red light that was invisible to the animals. That turns out to be kind of tricky. Um, and then I wanted to have, I didn't want to just leave bait on the bottom because that just attracts scavengers. I wanted an optical lure, so that's where the electronic jellyfish came in. I couldn't get this funded. Right. I, you know, I, I went to the major funding agencies and they would always say the same thing. But what will you discover? <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> so I had a ser series of mishaps that I describe in the book, including having the camera flood at one point on national television um, and you know, having to scrounge money to be able to make it work and finally getting the, the th everything operational for an expedition to the Gulf of Mexico in 2004, where I put the Eye in the Sea camera system on the bottom with the optical lure. I had about four hours of video that I was observing, and I was so excited because I had my window into the deep sea. I could see these animals moving around, and I could tell for sure this time that they weren't being disturbed by the lights the way I'd seen in the past. And then four hours into the deployment, I had programmed the electronic jellyfish to come on for the very first time with this pinwheel display that I thought was a type of display that would attract large predators. I swear this is true, 86 seconds after it came on for the first time, we recorded a squid over six feet long, completely new to science. I could not have asked for a better proof of concept. <laughs> I went back to the National Science Foundation and I said, this is what we will discover. <laughs> yeah. And they gave me a half a million dollars to do it right. Yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, as you described that camera flooding, that horrible sinking feeling you had, and you had a teammate who said, anybody can deal with plan A, it's how you cope with plan B that defines you. And it really struck me throughout your book, and Juliet, this touches on yours as well, um, that the technology is incredible, the biology is amazing, but really when it comes down to it, what we collectively need are teams and high-functioning teams. And Julie, you were talking about how hobbyists and research scientists are sort of operating in parallel, amassing incredible amounts of knowledge that could be useful to each other, but are not collaborating. Yeah, yeah, there's like a huge coral world up here on land. Um, these the coral aquarists who, who raise coral in aquaria in their garages, in their basements, in their living rooms, and they actually, um, have developed a lot of tools that are now being shifted to coral restoration. And um, they're, one of the things that these coral people have discovered is that if you cut a coral, if you, if you actually saw it, and create this a little nubbin, which they call a frag, it grows as much as five times faster than a, a, a regular coral. And so you can expand, you know, you can grow coral a lot faster and as they're starting to farm coral, this is a really important technique. And the coral aquarists have known this for decades, that this is what they do to create new pieces of coral that they sell or give to other, other people um, who are hobbyists. And, and now the scientists are sort of taking these techniques and using them to propagate coral, which then they can replant on the reefs out in the oceans. And a lot of the pieces, the equipment, the little stubs that you put the coral on, the racks that you grow them on, they all came from the aquarium hobby. And, and yet, the hobbyists have like their own names for coral that aren't scientific names, and the scientists 
have their you know, scientific names, and, and they really haven't spoken to each other that much, except for that, you're right, it's, it's changing in that um, there's a really horrible disease going through the Caribbean right now called stony coral tissue loss disease, and, and it, it's, it's very infectious. It, it, it infects about 22 species of coral, and the tissue just kind of melts off these coral. And so what the scientists are doing is going out in front of the infection front and collecting healthy coral, and then they're putting them in aquaria up here on land. And so the zoos and aquaria who have been part of this ho hobby, or the hobbyists, um, not just hobbyists, but like professionals who do this as well, they are actually holding coral in safety up here on land while this terrible disease sweeps through the Caribbean. Yeah. While I ask Edie a similar question about science and projects that excite you, I'd like to welcome those of you in the audience who have questions to come to the front and stand in front of the microphones so that we can take your questions for the final 10 minutes of, of the session. So in terms of teamwork, collaboration, exciting science projects that you're keeping an eye on right now, Edie, do you want to mention any of them in particular? Uh, well, actually, I've been involved in a couple recently that are pretty exciting. Um, I had to sign an NDA, so you'll just have to watch National Geographic next year. <laughs> oh, <geezer. laughs> But uh, it's the best bioluminescence ever filmed anywhere. Um, so the new camera systems are amazing, and I'm also working with a colleague on some newer types of cameras that are um, smaller, cheaper, easier to deploy. I want to get as many of them out there as I possibly can because the more opportunities for observation, the more discoveries we'll make. That's right. I can see we have a lot of people and just a little bit of time, so please keep your questions concise and let us know who you'd like to answer it. We'll start on this side and then go back and forth. Go ahead. I, I'd like to uh, thank you guys for coming, the sign language interpreters as well. Um, my question's about uh, communication and getting the word about climate change out there. I was a biologist in undergrad and then moved more in toward uh, sort of the policy realm. I'm interested to know, how do you communicate the dangers of oceans and climate change in, in the modern era? Is it a story about what we have to lose or is it a story about what we have to gain? I've been trying to emphasize what we have to gain. I think when we emphasize what we have to lose, too many people shut down. It's been said that Martin Luther King did not mobilize the civil rights movement by preaching, I have a nightmare. But <laughs> that's what the environmental community keeps doing and wondering why nobody wants to listen. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree also. I think it's about what we have to treasure here on this planet, which is so much and it's way more than we even know. More than sending rockets. <laughs> yeah. All right, over here. Hi there. I used to live in Papua New Guinea, yeah. and in that area, uh, there is a, a mine on land, but it has been disposing of all of the mine tailings in the deep sea by just piping it way out. Um, it, is there, do you know of any studies on, on like, well, how bad is this <laughs> going to be? And then a second question is, uh, how much danger are we in from people that want to start uh, doing mining on the ocean floor? Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just horrified by the mining on the ocean floor thing. I mean, we've already been seeing trawling, but they're talking about mining at vent sites, you know, these just incredible um, hotbeds of biodiversity, and they just want to scrape them. And, and uh, it's, it's going to be horrific and once again out of sight and out of mind. And the, pop -pop, the dumping on the bottom, nobody's looking at that. I mean, we, we, we're, we're putting the Artemis in the air for $40 billion. We can't spend any money to go down and look at what all this dumping has done to the bottom of the ocean. It feels to me like this weaves together the previous question as well. A lot of assumptions are made that the, um, the ocean is empty and lifeless and it's just mud with nothing in it. And what we know is everywhere we look, we find incredible richness and life. So is you. part of the problem that, that uh, these are like international waters and is there something that like international agreements that have to be made by everyone? They've been trying to make agreements and failing. Um, 
for years now? Yeah. This is a big and complicated question, and I think to be continued. Uh, thank you again for speaking. I really enjoyed this. Um, as a student in my last year of college, I'm getting a degree re related to environmental policy, but I spend so much time overwhelmed by the amount of change that needs to happen and feeling hopeless about the future. Um, so what advice would you give to someone who wants to contribute and really make a change but feel like individual contributions could never outweigh the insurmountable effects of climate change? Well, I, I feel like we've got this disconnect from the natural world that is really problematic. And in my own backyard, I've seen real change with citizen science. Um, we have a citizen science team at, at ORCA, um, our organization, that we, we train rigorously. To, so they're doing real science that's um, expanding our understanding of our local environment. And it creates environmental stewards. It en enhances understanding of science. Um, and it, it creates a sense of community, um, all of which has been missing. So I, I, I'm a big advocate for high quality citizen science. Hi, my name is, uh, my question is for Julie. Um, you showed some pictures of the bleached coral reef and then the revitalized, restored coral reef in that same Indonesian reef there. Uh, and you mentioned the rebar star, reef stars, I think, that was used. Um, I guess if it takes just one to two degrees of temperature change to bleach the coral, how much more does it take to restore that coral? Because I'm very interested in how that restored in that same area. So, um, so that, it, the, the bleached reef, well, the bleached reef, so th actually the reef that um, was restored was a bombed out reef. So there is a thing called blast fishing, which is common in uh, around coral reefs, unfortunately. So that one actually had been blast fished, and unless they put those reef stars in place, that rubble would roll around, and um, you couldn't, a reef couldn't reestablish itself there. So that reef had been 30, bombed 30 years ago, the one where the reef stars were. Um, but you do see sort of a similar crumbling in a bleached out reef. So I, I, um, I should be clear that they weren't the same places. Um, and what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> like, how, how could you restore a bleached, a, a bleached reef? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, so this, that Reef Star project has been only used about on over 10 hectares, but that is the largest restoration that exists right now. Um, the question is, will that work in other places around the world? And, and so that's still to be seen. Um, they have just done some installations in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef and also in Mexico. Um, but it hasn't been long enough to see if they'll come back in those places yet. Yeah. Thank you. So I apologize, but we only have time for one final question. Hi, thank you again. Um, what advice do you have for those of us who are not scientists but would love to contribute to conservation? How can we be, be parts of these big teams? Um, how can we best have impact? Um, I think one way is to, a really easy way is to call your Congress people all the time and tell them that you care and that, <laughs> you know, we need to be worried about climate change in a way that is um, more serious than the way we have been. Um, so that's one thing you can do, just put it on your reminder every month to call your Congress people. Um, but I, I also have a sense that art and communication matter a lot. I think as we bring art and science closer together, we have more impact because people tend to work on, have action when they feel something. And, and we can know something intellectually in our brain, but we don't always take action based on that. But when we feel something, that's when we act. So connecting, connecting science and art is really important. Okay. We've had a special dispensation from the organizers of the <laughs> festival for one final okay. question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what can my school community do to help the ocean? 
You can write to politicians, too. <laughs> Thank you. You'd be surprised how much they listen. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who cares enough to ask that question of what can we do. I think the answer is more than you might think, and there's certainly reason for hope in a whole vast ocean to care for in our own particular ways. Thank you so much, Julie Berold, Dr. Ida Witter, and thank you all of you, you guys, in our session.